Thank you, Stephen, for uh, getting us started there and, and your, your message there. Talking about, when we talk about the importance of networking and all the resources in here, but I think you, when you talk about the fear, the, the apprehension that can be there, I think that's a valuable thing to recognize. It's, it's early on a Friday morning as well, another thing we should recognize, but I don't know if you've had a chance since you've come in to see uh, the room next door with uh, many of the other resources on display, things we can talk about. People throughout the day will be talking about these resources and uh, lots of things we can learn about here. Um, one thing I want to acknowledge when I got off the stage here, I quickly, quickly picked up all my papers and things like that. I thought I took your speaking notes. I was, felt bad that it turned out that speaking notes for the next presenter. They are back up here, just so you know that. Okay. <laughs> On that note, let me talk about our next keynote speaker uh, this morning. He's the CEO of the Wellesley Institute. He is an international expert on social causes of mental illness, suicide, and the development of effective, equitable health systems. Now, as a physician, psychiatrist, researcher, and policy advisor, he has worked to identify the causes of mental illness in cross-cultural health for over two decades. He's also an active, funded researcher of social, community, clinical, and policy issues and has nearly 200 academic publications, including four books. Last night as I was preparing, I was trying to go through his blog posts and his latest things, and, and uh, certainly a lot of research there to go through. Now, in addition to joining the Wellesley Institute as CEO in March 2014, he's a medical director responsible for dual diagnosis, child, youth, and family and geriatric services, and director of health equity at CAMH. He's a full professor and co-director of the Division of Equity, Gender, and Population in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. Further, he is the president of the Canadian Mental Health Association Toronto, and he sits on the board of the United Way Toronto. So please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Kwame McKenzie. You guys don't make a lot of noise, do you? Um, what a beautiful sight. Look at you. This is, when I came to Toronto about eight years ago, this is what I thought Toronto would look like. What a beautiful sight. Have you looked around the room? Oh, God. You're asleep on a Friday morning. Have you looked around the room? Yeah. 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 Have you looked at what Toronto looks like? Have you looked at what the possibilities are here? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it's spectacular. It's beautiful. Um, Black History Month, and consequently, always nice to have some... Uh, words from uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, but think about those words when I'm thinking about, when I'm talking about what the possibilities that are here, uh, and when I talk about resilience today. Uh, I have had to let you know that I have not conferred with the first two people who've spoken. I haven't conferred with Justin Trudeau, and I haven't conferred with um, uh, Mr. Chavez, um, but we're saying similar things uh, in part. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Silma and her team at Progress Career Planning Institute for asking me to speak, but it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have got uh, a, a Catholic upbringing, so being at the 13th of anything makes me a bit nervous, okay? <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity because uh, I believe in uh, Canada. I came here eight years ago as a newcomer and I believe in you and I believe in the opportunities uh, that we can have together if we can launch you properly. So I hope you're going to be able to ask questions, get answers, get connected um, and try and move yourself forward. For those who are really interested in healthcare, I've got to go to another meeting, but if you just Google me, my email address comes up and I answer emails. And feel free to connect with me and contact me. Uh, and if I can help you, I will. Now, I won't uh, sort of tell you that there are no challenges. Of course, there are significant challenges to developing a meaningful career in Canada. And I don't want to underplay them at all. But I do hope that you'll be able to leave today with renewed hope and energy. Uh, I'm really pleased that the CBC are here because when I came eight years ago, uh, seeing what was happening in the CBC, seeing, uh, listening to Andy Barry in the morning and then seeing Matt Galloway take over from Andy Barry really made a difference to me about thinking what was possible and what this country was. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the big picture and this will be saying things that I think we're just agreeing uh, with. And I'm going 
going to talk a little bit about an idea of mental capital and mental health, because actually, in the end, keeping yourself psychologically healthy is going to be one of the most important things you can do for your uh, career going forward. And then I'm going to talk about resilience, how you balance your life so that you can get on. Now, one of the things that um, uh, I remember me, I was doing when I first came in my first migration, this is my second migration, my first migration was to Belgium, was uh, it was like I was getting on a bike and I was just pedaling, pedaling, pedaling and getting nowhere. Yeah, and eventually fell over. Um, uh, but part of that was because I didn't have any balance in my life and I didn't organize my life to be resilient. And so that's one of the reasons why I want to talk a little bit about resilience uh, in, when, uh, in a few minutes' time. Balanced lifestyle leads resilience, and it helps you get a big, it helps you get a job. So what is the big picture? Well, I think people have already said. One of the things people forget is this is the 11th biggest economy in the world. There is lots that we can do here. There's lots that's available. There's lots of opportunity. Uh, but for Canada to move forward, you have to succeed. As uh, Stephen said, all prices are going down. Raw material prices are going down. So that 70% of the population, which is most of you, that work in service industries are going to be the engine that moves Canada forward. It's not going to just be raw materials. Those industries such as uh, finance and IT, engineering, are significantly based in Ontario. And within Ontario, they're based in Toronto and the GTA. Uh, I know that there are people outside who are also talking about the opportunities that are in London and the Middlesex region. And there are big IT opportunities there. Um, but, and 50% of people in this area are immigrants. 50% are newcomers, uh, are, are visible minorities. So if Canada is going to move forward, it needs us. Now, previous governments didn't really get this, and I'm non-partisan. I am not having a go at Mr. Harper. I am not going to get into Hairgate and talk about his hair and talk about Justin's better hair, because I have no hair at all. And <laughs> so it would just sound like a little bit of envy there. So I'm not going to get into that. But the previous government didn't get that. And from the letter that has come to this conference, you'll see that the current government does get that. The current government realizes that Canada's future is our future. If we succeed, Canada succeeds. If we don't succeed, Canada doesn't succeed. So it's not a huge surprise when you look at the new cabinet that the new cabinet is more diverse. And it's not a huge surprise that at the moment the government is trying to find new senators specifically from diverse communities. The new federal government cares about Canada and therefore, it cares about Canada's diversity. But it's not just at the federal level, it's also at the provincial level. At the provincial level, we've got the poverty reduction strategy, but we've also got, uh, just from the budget yesterday, we've got uh, a new system where uh, you know, you'd be able to get free tuition in higher education, you know, investing in the future, investing in Canada at a time where we need to invest if we're going to move forward. So they get it. And then, of course, this year, for me, it makes a difference because they recognize Black History Month in Ontario for the first time. And at the same time, they've set up an anti-racism uh, department in Ontario. So this government gets it. And then we have John Tory. And if I'm right, he was here last year. And he was speaking last year because he gets that the success of Toronto is going to be built on you. So when you think about it, we've got the municipal government, we've got the Ontario government, and we've got the federal government 
all interested in us. And the challenge is how do we use that? How do we see a future in that? And how do we develop our resources, our personal resources, in order to capitalize on that opportunity? How do we do that? Now, what resources do we need? What personal resources do we need? So, it's difficult because I don't know what's behind me. I could have had the wrong slides. It could have been a picture of uh, my farm or a dog or a cat or something like that. It could be something worse than that. Um, around the world, governments have been saying, what do we need to make ourselves more economically competitive? And the UK did a big project in 2005. They got in contact with all of the uh, most important academics and they said, well, what do we need as a country to make ourselves more competitive? And there were lots of answers that they came up with, but the most compelling answer to the government was this idea of mental capital. They basically said, high-income countries are never going to out-manufacture low-income countries. You're not going to out-manufacture India or China, and labor costs are just too high. It's not going to happen. We have to be able to outthink them. And if we have to be able to outthink them, we have to nurture our mental capital. And straight away, people were straight away, they were thinking, oh, mental capital, that's all about um, making people smarter, giving people more knowledge, uh, giving people a few more skills. That's not the case. Mental capital is three things. It is a bit about knowledge and acquisition of skills but it's also about developing your EQ, your emotional intelligence, and last, it's about keeping on to your mental health. So mental capital equals IQ, EQ, and mental health. How many of you have an Apple device with you today? Yeah. How many of you have an IBM device with you today? You're by yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so three of you. There is no difference in the level of IQ at Apple or IBM. No difference at all. In fact, IBM had developed the tablet computer before Apple. The difference between IBM and Apple is their EQ, their emotional intelligence their understanding of what they do, their understanding of what you need, and their understanding of how to sell it to you. How to make you fall in love with your iPhone. I'm not gonna ask how many people are in love with their iPhone, because that's a bit creepy. Um, you know, but how to make you fall in love with your iPhone, even though over 15 years or 20 years, they've had six varieties of iPhone, which means you have to buy a new one every three years if you wanna keep up. That's crazy stupid, but they're able to work you because they understand how you work. In a service economy, in an economy that is built on ideas, having good ideas is great, being smart is great, but being able to develop your IQ and understand how to deploy those and what other people need is even more important. For the same level of IQ, IBM versus Apple. The people with the highest level of EQ are the people who do best. And they're the companies that do best as well. Now, EQ you can develop. Go online, there are free courses to develop EQ. But remember, mental capital, the stuff you need to move on, is IQ, EQ, and then your mental health. Now, mental health, can be difficult to preserve. I, I know this out of experience. Um, my first migration was to um, Belgium. Um, in about 2000, 1995 I think it was, I was living in the UK, working as a doctor, doing research, two kids, two year old, four year old, everything was going well. And then my wife was given her perfect job. She was offered her perfect job. 
Um, but the perfect job was not in England. It was in Brussels. And they needed a decision very quickly. So, at short notice, I moved to Brussels. I knew very little about Belgium. I didn't speak the languages. I had no community or professional ties. I was going to have to change from being a physician to being an, an academic to being a house husband. Uh, so, by the way, being a physician and an academic is easier than being a house husband. <laughs> <laughs> if, if anybody, if anybody doesn't realize that. <laughs> yeah, so it is much easier. And not surprisingly, with this big change, with no preparation, not thinking it through, being sort of in my 30s or something like that and thinking, oh, I can do this, I can do anything. It went really badly. Uh, by six months, I was depressed. I can even remember developing anxiety attacks uh, while cooking. That's not because my cooking's awful. Uh, but uh, developing anxiety attacks, full-blown sweating, just seeing a, a plate of penne and for somehow that triggered something. Uh, as not in a good way. And I doubt I was a very good husband. I doubt I was a very good father. And I very much doubt I'd have been able to move forward unless I dealt with that mental health issue. And what I did partly because as an academic, is, uh, well, there's one thing I did which I thought was quite funny, is I joined a group. <coughs> In Belgium, they have a group called Studs. <laughs> okay, uh, a bit dodgy. Spouses trailing under duress successfully. Yeah, uh, so I became a stud. That was one of the things that I did. Uh, and that's partly because there are five things that you need to do to get balance and be resilient. And what I found in Belgium was doing those didn't only preserve my resilience and mental health, they also helped me get a job. And I found subsequently, almost always when things have been going badly, if I make sure that I've got my life balanced, I do better. So, you know, the analogy of the bike works. If you're pedaling really hard but you're not balanced, you're going to fall over. That is what's going to happen. But if you're balanced, you're going to get to where you want to go. And there are five things you need to do to promote resilience and help you balance. The first is stay connected. Second is stay active. The third is stay inquisitive. The fourth is keep learning. And the fifth is give back. And sometimes we're really, really trying to get on in our life. We're trying to get on in our um, professions. We're trying to get a job, and we're not balanced. But balance sees us through hard times. This balance helps us move on. So what I did, this is in Belgium, is I connected my professional network in the UK and tried to get them to connect me to people in Belgium. Um, I made sure I maintained those connections because those are the foundation of uh, my professional life. As I said, I became a stud, uh, partly because they were talking about being successful. They weren't talking about mm, sort of sitting in a group and complaining to each other. They weren't talking about looking backwards to where you come from and saying it was better than you are here because you're here, so you have to look forwards. They wanted to be successful in being who they were. I started playing a team sport rather than doing sport just by myself because I thought that would increase, increase connections. So I used activity to increase connections. And I noted one of the groups that was in the marketplace is the YMCA Toronto. And the YMCA GTA Toronto is just a brilliant place. 50% of all newcomers to the GTA go through the YMCA uh, GTA. Yeah. This is a place of significant connections and they want to be city builders. But I started playing soccer with NATO. They had a pickup soccer match in NATO, so I thought I'd play with NATO. One of the things to stay in uh, to keep me inquisitive, that mindfulness thing, was I just started touring around on the bus or on the train 
around Brussels, just to see what was there. Uh, Brussels is a very odd place, uh, but it's spectacularly beautiful, amazing history, loads of things going on, uh, and, you know, I had time to experience. Uh, actually, I was sort of reflecting when I went into the marketplace, and in some ways I had more time in Brussels than I have now, because of all these things happening, all these pieces of help to move us forward that I just didn't know about. But they're just sitting out there, the people wanting to help and move you forward. Um, with regards to learning, I decided to upgrade my professional skills, not because I thought it would help me get a job, but because what it did is it produced a discipline of getting up every morning, uh, having something to do, structure to the day, after I dropped the kids off at uh, nursery. And as giving back, I decided to offer my skills. Thank you very much. <laughs> so cheers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I must have been getting a little bit. Was I getting a little bit dry? No. Oh, okay. It was just, just a random act of kindness. How lovely. Um, um, <laughs> so, in, in order to give back, I decided to offer my services as a volunteer to a community psychiatric hospital, but also that built connections. Two minutes, right. Now, where did this get me? Well, first, I knew though I was qualified, and though I could work in Belgium, there was no way I was ever going to work in Belgium as a doctor. I never worked as a doctor in Belgium. It just wasn't possible. I had the license, but it was never going to happen. Uh, through my connections, through keeping those connections, I was asked um, because somebody else had dropped out to write a book on depression. And because at the time I was a bit depressed, uh, I thought it was a good thing to do. Uh, and that book sold about 300,000 copies and is available in seven languages. It was just, it was a bit of luck. <laughs> Better just buy it. Um, <laughs> so, a um, person in the NATO soccer group got me some contract work in the European Union, working with public health in the European Union. I, I would never have thought of doing that. It was just through those connections, something came up. Through staying inquisitive, I started writing uh, articles and selling them to the local English language newspaper because people hadn't been um, uh, you know, going around uh, Brussels, there was lots of people didn't know, so I was able to come up with new uh, stories. I'm pretty sure I'm a better doctor than I was because I renewed my skills. And uh, through volunteering, I was asked to write three academic papers, and one of them was about suicide in people with severe mental health problems. And you heard earlier in my CV that I'm a specialist in suicide. That started there. That wasn't something that I ever thought I was going to do. But the major thing I learned from all of this um, was that migration opened my imagination. I would have just stayed going down the same path. I wouldn't have been open to different possibilities if I hadn't had to. You know, they talk about this idea of necessity breeding ingenuity. That's what happened. It wasn't easy, in fact it was really hard, and I had a difficult time, but it helped me in the long run. But because I was open to opportunities, I was able to move forward. Change the course of my career. I became more resilient. I became less rigid. Uh, and I became able to take a bigger look at taking risks and seeing what the opportunities could be. I think I'm a better person. Um, you'd have to ask my wife whether I am actually a better person, but I think I am. And I think that's because I've tried to stay connected, stay active, keep learning, stay inquisitive, and give back. So my message for you um, is that this is a time of opportunity. It may not feel it always, but it is a time of opportunity. And 
the opportunity isn't back where you were. The opportunity for me is not in England. The opportunity is here and now. And there are significant opportunities. Develop your IQ, develop your EQ, and look after your mental health. Balance your life. It pays dividends, not only for getting jobs, but for enjoying life. And like, like this isn't a rehearsal. We have one life we should enjoy then. Okay? But don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of doing something completely different. If you're here and if you've got through all the citizen immigration Canada checks, you're smart. Yeah. And the smart people of the future are able to do a few different things, try different things. Uh, this idea that we do one thing and we're carrying it on forever, that's less and less what the workplace is like. But lastly, I'm being told to wind up. In the past, by the way, when people have told me to wind up, I've gone back to the audience and I've said, are you enjoying this? If so, we'll ignore them. Um, uh, but I'm not going to do that today, because it's rude. <laughs> yeah. um, I just gang up on people, it works. So, remember what this is all about in the big picture. It is about, in a service environment, if you're happy, if you're balanced, you will do the best work you can, you will be the best community member you can, and you will move forward. You may not get everything you want, but if you don't know exactly where you're going, at least be happy on your journey. Okay? I... Oh. As a, just a round off, um, between from 1995 to 2002, I moved from being a stud to um, uh, giving advice on the World Bank, to the World Banks. And if I can do it, I don't see why you can't. Thank you very much.